morning. We got some uh, new faces, old faces, uh, some students starting up school, uh, returning, all those kind of things. Uh, so all kinds of things to remember as we pray and continue uh, to try to be a church that sends people out to live in the way of Jesus. And that's our prayer this morning uh, that we would do that. Uh, that we connect with God and we sent out. A few quick announcements. Um, Constantine Swords, a film today that's being shown at the Circle Cinema. Uh, some of us have been doing a discussion deal on Constantine. And so 2 o'clock today at Circle Cinema, I believe. Is that right, too? Yes. 2 o'clock. We'll meet there. And uh, some of us will go out to lunch before then. But anyway, but uh, hopefully if you want. And it's supposed to be free. The last time I talked to the guy, he kind of runs the place. He said he was going to do it free. So. 25 words or less, what's the movie? Uh, they've seen it. 25 words or less. Maybe 15. Um, <laughs> the explorations of a guy who's uh, taking a look at the history of the cross and saying, wow, I didn't know it was so great. It has as good as it has as bad. Go on. Community groups, some of them are kind of meeting casually, some or whatever, in our missional community groups, but uh, just stay tuned in the next few weeks. You'll be hearing more about that, how you can kind of plug in to a group during the week um, to help you uh, continue on this journey with Christ. Uh, and then also today, because school start back up, we uh, will begin to tear back down each week and back in and keep everything cleaned up, so just encourage you to help uh, where you can with that so we get things ready for the people that are here during the week. So, any other invitations, announcements? New financial Peace University class. Um, if you've heard from all your friends about how great this class is, um, we are having another one starting September 7th is the preview. So if you're just wondering what this class is, September 7th at Braden Park, which is at Fort and Yale. Um, Six o'clock on Sunday night. Uh, we will have a preview come. There's no, I mean, no, you know, pressure to sign up there. This is just come check it out. Um, and then if you want to sign up for the class, the first class will actually be the following Sunday, so on the 14th. It's a 13-week class um, and really great class. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me any questions. Cool. Anything else? Are you meeting here? Yeah. No, it'll be meeting at Brayden Park. Meet at Brayden Park. Yeah. Your eyes open for God. Barbara's words feel her for science of his presence. Remember the world of wonders she has made, his miracles, and the birds. He's ready. He's God, our God, and Charlotte of all And he remembers, whenever it's a for a thousand generations, he's been as good as his word. Looks like tonight, the sky is heavy.
morning we gather together and we check back in as part of a family called together by your love and by your grace and by your goodness. God, we long for your touch and we need your voice. Would you speak to us this morning through each other, through these songs, through your spirit, through your word as we learn and listen and as we hear from you. God, in all things, we praise you, and we give you thanks. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Good morning. Glad you're here. Welcome back. For those of you that were gone for a summer, because you do that every summer, you go away. Good. Welcome back. Um, glad TU starting up again. I'm hoping to get a job at TU the year my daughter enrolls. I think that'll be a good idea. Uh, if you have a Bible, we're in the book of Genesis. We are in chapter 3. We've been studying the book of Genesis since 1990, and we are just now in chapter 3. Some of you don't know what 1990 is. It's a year that was a long time ago. Just trust me on this. This series, Our Story Begins, is kind of an attempt to go back to these ancient narratives that at the very beginning of the Bible and to pay attention to how the story starts. How a story begins tells you so much about it. It's kind of the launching place. And we talked last week about how we tell these stories like children's stories. So simple and so shallow. And there's nothing wrong with telling it to a six-year-old the way you would tell this story to a six-year-old. That's healthy for a six-year-old. But at age 18, you should start be hearing it differently. By age 30, it should be speaking at a new level to you and in a new way and so on and so forth. I won't go any further because most of you can't imagine someone that old, but just go with it. Um, and so we're in Genesis chapter 3. I've got the verses up on the screen, and I'd like us just to read through this little narrative. We're going to only go to verse 11 today. Genesis 3 is one of those chapters in the Bible that is incredibly divisive. And we're just not going to be divisive today because that's not who we are. Um, and so we're going to read through this text, and we're going to stay with the story. I'm going to warn you right now, some of you have these fancy, impressive things called systematic theologies. You know who you are. You came with it in your back pocket. You kick it everywhere you go. I want you to keep it in your pocket today. Okay? Good. I'm glad we agree. If your name is Hudson and you're over the age of 30, raise your hand. Great, those are our designated readers. Would you do me a favor? Sure. And just take turns and read through this chapter with us. Whoever wants to read about nudity can go first. Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Ooh. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? 
He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> That's what we're going to do today. Pretty short little snippet, 11 verses. There's a ton more in chapter 3. I know some of you want to get there next week. We'll do that. Uh, as we start, I want to do a little bit of Genesis vocabulary. Because it's important to have vocabulary kind of agreed on when you talk about terms. So we're going to start with this one. Oh, isn't that cool? Fancy graph. Um, first of all, the serpent. Everybody say serpent. 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 The ancient word serpent actually comes in Hebrew. The word in Hebrew actually means serpent. <laughs> Don't translate somebody else's name there. You with me? There's this huge deal that most of the Christians I know, that when they read this story, they read the word serpent, but they read somebody else's name. And it's not Steve Jobs. <laughs> right? Nod your head if you've heard this before. The words serpent and Satan occur together one place in your Bible. Revelation. And even there, it's not the serpent, Satan. It's the great dragon, that ancient serpent, Satan. Now, you do theology your way, and I respect your freedom and, and ability to do that. I think that's important. Gosh, I would just advise you that I wouldn't use the book of Revelation as my primary hermeneutical instrument in Scripture. What is a hermeneutical instrument? Yes. <laughs> I was showing off my vocabulary. If you're going to figure out what Genesis means, I wouldn't start with Revelation. I just think there's some wisdom in that. And I know I'm going to step on somebody's toes with this. Um, but whenever you're interpreting books of the Bible, and always, I, I do think it's doggone important to let the Bible interpret the Bible. Right? If Jesus said he saw something one way, I'd pay attention to that. If Paul, you know, interprets something one way, I'd pay attention to that. But anytime somebody is using an Old Testament book to proof text a New Testament book, or the other way around, notice that they're not in the same language, and they're not written by the same peoples. They're not written in the same time. They're probably thousands of years apart, certainly hundreds of years apart. You've heard people do this all the time, Right? Pay attention to that. I'm, just gonna, I'm, I'm highly critical of it. I, anytime somebody says, I was reading the book of Revelation, and you know it says in the book of Daniel. Wow. I love letting Daniel interpret Revelation, but I'm talking about Daniel Sharples interpreting Revelation, not the book of Daniel. They're both apocalyptic literature, but they're very different. <laughs> yeah, some of you are, never mind. Okay, so this is who, who is this character? The serpent. Every time I've ever heard a sermon on Genesis 3, the whole point of the sermon has been about the serpent. This is more attention than he's going to get from me all day. Because in the text, he has two lines. And then he's gone. Think of it like a play. Who gets the attention? It's not him. So, my opinion. We can talk more about that later over coffee if you'd like. So, that's the serpent. Second vocabulary word. What's that one? Come on now. What, there are two trees in the center of the garden. What are they? Tree, tree of what? Life. life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Tree of life is God say they can't touch it. No. God never says don't touch that one. In fact, he doesn't even say don't touch this one. He says don't eat its fruit, which is an interesting thing. They're welcome to go to the tree of life. They eventually won't get to because, as we'll discover next week, they make some choices. And one of the outcomes is, oh, no, now you're out. Part of what happens in Genesis, particularly in these first 11 chapters, is God seems to want to keep things in its position. What is God doing in Genesis chapter 1? This is a review for those of you that were asleep that week. Those three weeks we went through Genesis 1. Giving Giving things places. God is ordering. He's separating. He's darkness from night, seas from land. He separates and pulls things apart and puts things in their place. There's this way in which creation can turn back into chaos. Back into... Thank you very much. Somebody was listening. 
Tohu vabohu. And so God is keeping things in their place. One of the things that happens in Genesis 3, in Genesis 7, in Genesis 11, is God has to keep humans in their place. We're going to play with that a little bit. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. By the way, I brought this handy-dandy uh, Jewish study Bible, which I truly love. You can borrow it to look at. You may not leave the room with it. I need it. It's mine. But you can buy one of your own on Amazon.com, and I'll send you a link if you like. I want to read you something that they say, and these are Tanakh scholars. These are people who read the Bible in its original language because they know it. And they write, they write this. The knowledge of good and bad may be a merism, which I don't know what that really is, but apparently it's a figure of speech in which polar opposites denote a totality. Like we would say, everything in heaven and earth, right? That means everything in between the two polar opposites. Knowledge can have an experiential, not just an intellectual sense, in biblical Hebrew. Good and bad could mean, good and, good and bad could mean weal or woe, or moral good and moral evil. We tend to hear this as the knowledge of good and evil. The Hebrew scholars would suggest to you it means the knowledge of right from wrong. The knowledge of everything that is good and everything that is wrong. The same way my eight-year-old son doesn't quite get it. You know? He understands bad things happen in the world. I mean, you know? I mean, he knows that. But he doesn't understand it the way you do. A hurricane hits Florida, and people are drowned out of their own homes, and he's like, oh, that's bad. He has no concept of what it's like, because he didn't mud out the houses in New Orleans and see how people's lives are completely obliterated. He doesn't understand true joy. For him, eating spaghetti, playing Super Smash Brothers, and having a buddy over to spend the night are all kind of on the same keel. Right? It's kind of like when I was 12 years old and I told, told a girl I love you. It meant the same thing as I love broccoli. You know? It, there's a depth and a nuance. It's almost like there's an immaturity still in the garden. Like they haven't come of age yet. One more. The Lord God. What does that mean? What's that mean? Yahweh Elohim. Anytime you see God or Lord in all caps, your translators are following a convention and not translating Yod, He, Vav, He, which is, the, which is the Hebrew name for God. Here's why I bring that up again. I brought it up two weeks in a row. I'll bring it up a third time. Here's why. Anytime you see Yahweh's name, you know this is a text about relationship. Start looking for what's happening relationally between God and humans. Is God connecting with humans? Are humans calling out for God? Is God ignoring humans? Are humans ignoring God? What's happening in the relationship in the text? Look for that every time you see that. Enough of that. Let's jump in. Oh, wait. All right, yeah. So the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. When I say the word naked, what do you think of? Nudity. Wait a minute. I, I didn't really mean that question. Um, <laughs> thinking about we hear it, yeah, we hear it in really different ways. There's the situation like Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes is running around his house naked and his parents are going, I know he has clothing. Um, Jaybird? Yeah, like that, yeah. It took me a second to translate because I'm over 40. Um, I'm old, I just don't get things anymore. I've never felt this old as I do. Uh, here's the deal. And then the other thing is we hear naked and we think something else. I remember the first time I ever went through this text with my high schoolers. And I had this kid named Mike, and he's 17 years old, and he's kind of figured out what girls are, and he's cute, and he thinks they're cute. And I, we read this line, and he raises his hand immediately. <laughs> Does that mean they're, like, having sex all the time? He's so proud of himself for asking that question, right? I don't know, Mike. I wasn't there. <laughs> Probably not, actually. Um, we think about nudity in terms of flesh and skin. But what's interesting is the very next line, the serpent was more cunning. The word cunning is almost the same word naked. I mean, there's only a nuance of a difference. And it's a very intentional wordplay. They're not just naked physically. They're naked intellectually. They're naked in their character. They're naked the way that children are when somebody starts to do a con. My kids, for a while, believed everything on TV was what they said it was. 
Daddy, if we buy that, we'll be happier. We need 10 of those. <laughs> Honey, it's a commercial. The word commercial comes from the Greek word lying. <laughs> I was going to make a point of joke there, but I'll just keep going. Um, there's a sense in which there's an innocence still there. The serpent is compared with them. The man and his wife are naked, but the serpent is not. The serpent is more crafty, more cunning than any of the wild animals. And he gets to talk. He said to the woman, did God, now here's the deal. I told you this before. We talk about this all the time now. Um, why do publishers print Bibles? So that you will buy them, not so you will read them. They go into passages like this, and everybody who's on their translation committee says, that's not the right way to translate that. Okay, thank you. We'll remember that. And then they print it this way anyhow, because that's the traditional way to render it. Because there's a lot of loaded expectations when we talk about the serpent. Did God really say? You know, that's how you're supposed to read it. That's not what it says. In the text, it's like the serpent's going to make a big long statement and he gets interrupted. Now, God said, don't eat from any of the trees in the garden. It's like he's having a conversation. And the woman, whose name will be Eve after this chapter, interrupts him. Right? God said, you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Whoa, dude. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. This is an interesting passage. God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Isn't it interesting? She talks about the tree that's in the middle rather than one of the two trees that's in the middle. I think that's interesting. And look at what she says at the end. You must not touch it or you will die. Is that what God said? That's not what God told the first human. The first human, Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, I think. From every fruit of the garden you may surely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For on that day, what will happen? Most translations, you will surely die, you will truly die, I tell you, you will die. The Hebrew does this infamous little um, word play. On that day, dying, you will die. News flash. Are Adam and Eve currently dying at this time? Yes. They have not eaten from the tree of life. God will say at the end of chapter 3, we can't let them have the tree of life now or they'll live forever just like us. We have to stop them. Again, God's separating God from humans, keeping humans in a place. We make it sound like they're, not, they're going to live forever right here. Dying, you will die. And you can disagree with me. I think they're already on their way. And, you know, different people read it differently, and that's fine. I could be wrong. I'm married, and I'm wrong often. Um, and so it's okay. I'm cool with it. Um, but part of what's at work here is this idea of dying. A part of them is still innocent and pure. Comments of getting lots of weird strikes. Lots of weird faces. I know, we talk about them living forever and happy, happy, go lucky, and no cares in the world. What's the significance of the I think it plays on the serpent and what he's trying to do to them. He is deceiving them because look at the very next line he says. He says, he says God's line exactly the other, in the exact negative. You will not be doomed to die. I mean, he negates God. He argues with God. And, they're, and he's both wrong, because they will die, right? We know it. We've seen the story. They die. But from a, at least an immediate perspective, he's telling the truth. You won't die tomorrow. If you think of it that shallowly, Right? You tell me, if you touch this, you're going to die. I'd expect, touch it, and I'll fall over. Probably a big, long, dramatic death scene, the Academy Award kind of performance. But he's, he's lying, and he's telling the truth. He sounds almost human. I was going to make a joke that he could run for office, but I'm not going to do that. So, verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, you, what will happen? Watch the eyes the rest of the text. Your eyes will be open. 
And you will know good and evil, right from wrong. You'll know all that stuff. This is a text that drives me crazy. Um, who committed the first sin? First of all, is the word sin in this text? No. Now, is it Paul will interpret this story as sin? And he'll blast both Adam and Eve, right? In one of the pastoral epistles, which is Titus, Timothy, Thessalonians. Um, I'm forgetting one. Anyhow, one of those, he attacks Eve. He says, for Eve sinned first, eating from the fruit. But in Romans, who does he say sinned first? What? Man. Man. Adam. For sin entered the world through Adam. What sin does Adam commit? He He does nothing. There's a snake talking to your wife, and you're going to just watch. You know, I get nervous when people I don't know talk to my family. Especially single men around my wife. Because she's pretty and I'm ugly and I wear it bubbles. And I'm that shallow. We, we talked about, I know, I'm just goofy. Uh, in chapter 2, we talked about that's a marriage text, the is there to one another. And we use that in weddings, and maybe you've heard that used in a wedding. I use this one in marriage. Not in the wedding ceremony, but in premarital counseling. I use it to talk to men about, we abdicate, we talk about football, we'll talk about our favorite sports, we'll talk about politics, we'll talk about business, we'll talk about money, we'll talk about people we don't like, we'll talk about our boss, we'll talk about work. But somebody mentions God and suddenly every man in the room has nothing to say. Suddenly we don't want to contribute to the discussion. And relationships work best when both people are talking. And both people. And both people are contributing, right? I know that's a pretty boring sermon, but it's a pretty important one. Philip, get your hand up. This story always seems like that maybe the woman was alone and the man wasn't there, but I might be wrong. It's the way we read it, and it's certainly the way we tell it. But it says she ate it, and then she turned to her husband. Some translations add the phrase, and it's not in the Hebrew, but they add the phrase, she, some, oh, in fact, look, the TNIV does it right here. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. Three or four translations put it that way, because it, it, it certainly is very implied. He's right there. We're talking about the Garden of Eden. We're talking about a nice little place. It's not like there's private rooms. And they're there together in it, and one of them goes silent. Gosh, that's how temptation works, isn't it? When you're faced with it and somebody else is silent, it's a lot harder to resist. Both of them are naked, and what happens to their eyes? Their eyes are opened. And notice things are different now. How are things different? Interpret the text. They're what? They're hiding. Shame and fear in every situation. All of a sudden, they have to hide from God. You remember the first time you hid from God? I remember it as plain as day. I became a Christian at 18, and when I became a Christian, I had not had the good little Christian upbringing most people had had. I had, you know, struggled a bit with what it meant to be human. And I made all kinds of mistakes. And I gave my life to Christ, and I repented of some major sins, and I tore things off my wall and gave things up and counted the cost and all that. And somewhere in my senior year of college, four years in, I committed a sin that I knew not to commit, and I did it anyway. And it violated my conscience and my faith to the point I couldn't go to church because I couldn't be around those people. And one of them that day came and got me. And I sat in church with my head below a pew the entire time. I was in a tradition where we took communion every week, and it was literally passed down the aisle. Somebody would stand here and pass it down the aisle, and I couldn't take communion. 
And I was hiding from them, I was hiding from me, and I was hiding from things change. What interests me, and maybe it does interest everyone else the same way, but what interests me is why would they do that? What, how did they get into that? How did they get to that moment? And there's a really interesting play on the words here. When the woman saw that the tree was good for eating and a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable as a source of wisdom. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband. He ate. I want you to notice these words here that are all about seeing and about the eyes. One of the things that happens in your, your Bible over and over and over is something that we just kind of ignore in our daily lives and we take for granted. What happens to us in our bodies comes through our eyes. Where the eyes go, the body follows. Over and over and over in Scripture, there is this pattern of what happens in the eyes affects the body. A modern day metaphor would be like the headlights of your car. Unless you've got a fancy James Bond gadget. Where you point your headlights, your car goes every time. You can say, I'm driving to Oklahoma City. But if you point your headlights north on 169, you're not going to get there. The car goes where the headlights go. The body goes where the eyes go. We want what we look at. I can prove that to you very easily by bringing in some sonic milkshakes. You would want a sonic milkshake. Maybe. I'm like that at night. I'm at home watching TV while I'm working on the computer doing something, and a commercial comes on for O-R-E-O. -E and suddenly I have a craving for chocolate cookies with a cream-filled center. Right? I never knew I was driving an ugly car until I saw somebody's beautiful car. I didn't know I needed a bigger house until I went into someone else's house, and they've got five bedrooms and a playroom and a nursery, and I don't ever want another baby until I see them. Right? What we look at affects what we want and who we are. The ultimate example in your Old Testament is King David. King David is not in his palace one day going, gosh, how can I do something really stupid that will mess up my dynasty, that will affect my family for generations, that will be a scar on my name? I can't let Jonathan Edwards outdo me on this. I need something bad. He's out on his portico one night looking around, and his eyes fall on a woman on the roof of her house taking a bath. And with the eyes see, the body wants. And he will mortgage his call for what his eyes saw. Jesus knows this. Jesus preaches in, John, in Luke 11 Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of light. When they're unhealthy, your body is not. Your eyes are what you're putting light on, and what you put light on, you want. All the serpent does is draw Eve's attention to something. All he does is get her to look at it. And the language of that, delight to the eyes, covet. It's the same word. Desirable is the word lust. Almost every other time it shows up in the Old Testament. What the eye see, the body wants. My question is, where have your eyes been this week? Where have my eyes been? What is it we put our eyes on? Do we put our eyes, do we focus on getting ahead, on getting enough, on having something, on she's got this and I don't, he gets that and I don't? Do we focus like that? And what does that do to us? What does that make us want? Do we drive around town looking at all these restaurants thinking, I want to eat like that and like that? Or do we put our eyes on how other people are eating and what they don't get? Are we focused on how fancy of a house we live in or on the homelessness of our city? Do we focus on how right things are for me or 
how unjust this world really is. Eve looks. I wonder what we're looking at. Hebrews says it this way. Chapter 12, verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning and shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. I promise it says that. That's when I need a remote. That's why every week we fix our eyes at communion. Wherever your eyes have been this week, and they've probably been a lot of different places, just like the rest of us. We bring ourselves back to a table where we're all the same. Where all of us stand on level ground. And where the host for the meal is Christ himself. Welcoming you, welcoming me, and saying, I invite you to live a different kind of life. Put your eyes somewhere else. We talk at Rivendell all the time about looking for where God is at work in the world and running to God there. It's hard for me to do that when my eyes are focused on me. And every week this table reminds me to look somewhere else. If you've never joined us before, we take communion every week. It's an open communion. Anyone is welcome at the table. We take a piece of bread and we dip in either wine or juice. And we spend this as a time of recentering ourselves and repositioning ourselves. All are welcome. Let's pray. Our creator and loving God, you have called us to live in your creation, your good and beautiful creation where we serve as stewards, where we serve as ambassadors, and where we work with you and for you. And God, we will confess freely that we struggle with wanting to grab for something that would be a shortcut to become more like you, to have something that hasn't been become something that we aren't. And we live in a day and a time when we are boldly encouraged to go after anything and everything we want to see at the expense of so many others. God, as we come to this table, we remember Christ. Remember Christ who so freely gave of himself that others would see and hear and know and taste how good you are. And as we follow in his footsteps and we walk this path, we long for people to know him. And so we offer you our hands and our bodies and especially our eyes that we would look through the world the way you have called us to. To look for your presence and to look for ways to join you there. We're willing to trade whatever we have to join you where you are. We remember Christ this morning, his life, his ministry, his good, amazing work his sacrifice on the cross, and his resurrection. As we take this bread, as we taste from this cup, we remember him again. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.
trying to open your eyes to what they want from you and what they'd like you to do, how they'd like you to go, who they want you to be. I, re I remind you of the words of the psalmist. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. I used to sing a little bedtime song to my children. I know the idea of me singing is scary. And one of the lines was, seek his face and show it to me. That would be my prayer for you this week. In school, at work, at home, in your neighborhood, with your friends, in this wounded, beautiful city. That you would seek the face of God and show it to everyone. I send you out. <laughs>